What is up, everybody? Happy Sunday. Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on X at Andy Herman NFL. Hopefully your Sunday and your March Madness are treating you well. Hopefully your bracket's going a little bit better than mine so far. Uh, before I get started, huge shout out to Sean Gamble, who is our brand new Pack-A-Day Podcast YouTube member. As far as news and notes from Saturday, not a ton to discuss. Eric Wilson officially back as a member of the Green Bay Packers. That was reported already, but the Packers made it official on Saturday. Outside of that, not a ton happening. No big signings, trades, re-signings, anything like that. And we're probably going to reach a little bit of a slower stretch from a you know transaction standpoint. I still think Green Bay is probably going to add a couple of players here or there, whether it's maybe a resigning of a Rudy Ford or maybe it's a, you know, bargain type free agent. I still think we might see one of those. Maybe, just maybe they could get in the Justin Simmons or Julian Blackman conversation, but more than likely, maybe one or two bargain free agents. And then we're going to get ready hot and heavy for the draft, which is going to be here before you know it. And then the draft gets here and all of a sudden we get all of these presence to unwrap. And we're going to go through all of the deep dives of who they drafted. Of course, we'll go through the undrafted free agents, any free agent pickups after that. And before you know it, it'll be, you know, rookie mini camps, mini camps, OTAs, training camp, 53 man breakdown, and it'll be the regular season. Trust me. I know it still seems far away, but this all goes insanely, insanely fast. But what we are going to talk about today is not Green Bay's free agent signings or transactions, we're going to be going over the rest of the NFC North. And these are always interesting episodes for me. Um, if ever you're wondering like, hey, Andy just does clickbait stuff. Trust me, I do not. Uh, number two, if I were, I probably wouldn't do these episodes. Generally, they don't do super huge numbers, but I really love them. And I think it's always really important to keep an eye on what's going on in the NFC North. It's I don't know if it's just one of those, you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer sort of things. But this is a huge offseason for the NFC North for a variety of reasons. Two big time quarterback changes, which will alter the shape and the face of the NFC North for a long time. Good, bad, or ugly, we don't know yet. I think this has the potential to be, like I said, a, a very earth shattering divisional offseason, specifically for the Chicago Bears, but certainly for Minnesota as well. Detroit's coming off NFC North champions, the Packers made the playoffs. This is a very, very interesting division. And for me, like I said, I think it's always worth keeping an eye on. I think the other thing too is we always have to remember, and I know you know this and I know this and everyone knows this, but you have an opportunity every single year. You win your division, you go to the playoffs. Like it starts there when the team actually starts setting their goals every year. More often than not, it, the, the only goal that they start with is win your division because that gets you a playoff spot. It gets you a home game. If you can do that, you've got your chance in the playoffs. And whether it's via your team just being really good or sometimes the other three teams just not being as good, your division matters a lot. Not only that, but you know, in a 17-game season, six of those games are going to be against your divisional opponents. These are your rivals. These are your teams that you do not want to see succeed. I don't care like how friendly little brothery the Detroit Lions are. You get to the playoffs. You don't want to see the Lions, the Vikings, and the Bears, and especially the Vikings and the Bears do well. So these offseason transactions, extremely important. And this is an extremely, extremely important offseason for everyone in the NFC North. Yesterday, I spent my time really breaking down and going over all of the offseason moves for the Green Bay Packers and how I would evaluate the Packers overall. Definitely go back and check out that episode if you have not already. But today we're going to be doing it with the three divisional opponents. Obviously, I'm not going to go into it as detailed. Yesterday's episode was, I think, 30-ish minutes. Um, if I were to do that, we'd be here an hour and a half by my quick back of the napkin math. Instead, we're just going to go through these relatively quick and kind of go over the main additions, the main subtractions, and really the things that you need to know at this point for each given team. And no better place to start really than with the Detroit Lions, who you can make an argument have maybe had the quietest or are probably going to have the quietest offseason of the three divisional opponents, but there's really nothing quiet about it. They've made some pretty serious transactions that are going to make their team better, and we should probably discuss those. Before we get to the actual additions on the field, though, remember, this was a Detroit Lions team. When you looked at their coaching staff, you were expecting Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn, one, if not both, 
were very likely to exit the team, their offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, respectively, for head coaching positions. Both of them received numerous opportunities to interview, yet both of them remain in Detroit. This felt like a, all right, Dan Campbell, let's see what you got because you're going to lose your top two assistants in Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn, or at least, at least, at minimum, Ben Johnson. Let's see what you can do without those two. Instead, the entire core of that coaching staff, Dan Campbell, Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, all back for another season. That is a huge shock. That was not expected at all. And that is a huge, huge win for Detroit because they keep together one of the best coaching staffs in football, in my opinion, with all three of them. I think they all bring something different to the table with Dan Campbell sort of being that energetic, chaotic in a good way, uh, you know, and just, I don't, not like authoritarian, but like he brings everything that you need from that head coaching position, but then you get the really great X's and O's from Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn. I think it's a beautiful mesh for the Lions, not if you're a Packer fan, but they get to keep those. Meanwhile, they bring in uh, Terrell Williams as a defensive line coach and run game coordinator, and then Deshae Townsend from the Jaguars as their cornerbacks coach and pass game coordinator. So they add a couple new faces to that defensive staff. But again, the real big takeaway here, Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, both back with the team. Now they do have some interesting losses on both sides of the ball. The biggest, Jonah Jackson, their really good guard, who's been a stalwart of their offensive line for some time now, he goes to the Rams and vacates the left guard spot, which is going to get filled by a different player who we'll talk about in just a moment. They also lose CJ Gardner-Johnson, who was a big free agent signing for them last offseason. Remember, though, he barely played for them at all due to an injury. He goes back to Philadelphia On paper, it's a pretty decent-sized loss for Detroit. In actuality, because he barely played last year, at least if you're comparing last year to what this year could be, it's not that big of a loss simply because he never really played all that much for Detroit, but a big free agent signing for the Eagles and still a loss for the Lions in some capacity. They had a couple other smaller subtractions, Julian Aquara, Zach Ertz, who remember they just picked up at the end of the playoff run. He never played a down for them, but he goes to the Commanders. Teddy Bridgewater retired their backup quarterback, and then they lose Anthony Pittman, Benito Jones, Chase Lucas, Matt Nelson, probably players you are much less familiar with and matter a whole heck of a lot less. They also released their safety, their veteran safety, Tracy Walker. And then as of late, remember Cam Sutton just got in trouble with the law. Uh, I think he's there's still a warrant out for his arrest, if I remember correctly. I didn't do too much digging into his off-field issues just because I don't care. Uh, but due to the off-field issues, they did release Cam Sutton this past week. Uh, so he is gone from the team as well. There's also some players who remain unsigned. Josh Reynolds, the wide receiver. I'm really hoping this player remains unsigned because I don't want to have to say his name on the podcast ever again because it's always a nightmare. I'm just going to call him Big V. Hala Puluvadi Vayatai, their big offensive lineman who's played some guard, who's played some tackle, who started some games for them. He remains unsigned. Tyson Alualu, Romeo Aquara, Charles Harris, Jerry Jacobs, Will Harris, Kendall Vilder. Uh, but Josh Reynolds and Big V, probably the two biggest of those who have played uh, some decent snaps for Detroit. They also have re-signed some of their own players. Graham Glasgow, who could be a key piece on that offensive line with them losing Jonah Jackson, although their big free agent signing as of late probably makes that a little less necessary, but still probably a key backup for them. Emmanuel Mosley, who was hurt a lot of last year, stays as a defensive back. Jalen Reeves-Maven, linebacker and core special teamer. Shane Zilstra, Michael Badgley, their kicker. Dan Skipper, you remember reporting eligible. Dan Skipper, he is back. Khalil Dorsey, Scott Daly, their long snapper. And wide receiver Donovan Peoples-Jones, who they traded for at the trade deadline last season. Those are all players who are back and re-signed with the team. Then here's the bigger thing. You know, if you if you look at it, they're, they're true big losses, really Jonah Jackson, right? As we mentioned, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson or CJ Gardner-Johnson, uh, but he barely played for them. But they have some pretty decent-sized additions that are already coming in this offseason. Let's start with that guard position because they lose Jonah Jackson, but in comes Kevin Zeitler, former Wisconsin Badger, offensive lineman for the Baltimore Ravens. They get a little bit older at that position, but Kevin Zeitler fits that Lions DNA perfectly. He's going to be able to step in, be that left guard, and Detroit probably doesn't really skip a beat at you know in any way. Then they go out and make some significant additions. We can talk about them losing Cam Sutton and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. They go out and get two corners. 
Carlton Davis. Now they spend a third round pick to go get Carlton Davis, but that's a really good corner. They've been trying to upgrade this defensive backfield for some time now. I think their hope is that they have that guy now in Carlton Davis who can be a legitimate legitimate starter on the outside. I tend to agree with them. He's been really good for the Buccaneers. Has given Green Bay problems in the past. That's a big time acquisition for them. They also get Amik Robertson, a little less known uh, for the Las Vegas Raiders. Slot corner, outside corner, undersized 5'9". He's a good player. Didn't always play a ton, but when he got on the field, made some plays happen. If I remember correctly, I think he had a pretty big pick six a season ago. Sort of a sneaky under the radar signing by them. And then they get two big time defensive linemen. Uh, DJ Reader on the interior of the defensive line. That is a big time literal and physical defensive lineman for them uh, to uh, sign. Um, He's obviously going to help their run defense tremendously. And then Marcus Davenport, the edge rusher for Minnesota. He never really got going for Minnesota, never really fully got healthy. He's had his ups and downs in both New Orleans and Minnesota. He's had some health issues. This is probably more of a you know, sort of semi-low risk, although you know it wasn't super cheap to get Davenport, but a semi-low risk and semi-high reward signing for them. But it adds certainly some depth and some versatility by getting Marcus Davenport and DJ Reader. One other very, very, very under-the-radar signing, Matthew Betts. If any of you know, or it might be Matthew, M-A-T-H-I-E-U, probably Matthew, uh, Matthew Betts. If any of you know who he is, tip of the cap to you. This was the CFL Defensive Player of the Year last year. He's 29 years old, but he had 18 sacks in 18 games last year in the CFL. Uh, that's, that's pretty big numbers. His odds of making the team, who knows, but they take a flyer on a CFL MV or Defensive Player of the Year. And they're going to try to make something out of him. And he, again, sort of fits that Lions, you know, what is it like knee scraping or knee biting, ankle biting, whatever it was, uh, DNA. Matthew Betts is going to do everything he can to make a team out of the CFL. And he had a really impressive season there. So an interesting off season for them. They also have some pretty significant draft capital. This is not a team that is like completely lacking in draft capital, even though they traded a pick away for Carlton Davis. They still have picks 29 61, 73, 92, 162, 206, and 246. That's a first, a second, two thirds, a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh round draft pick that they still have at their disposal. So they they have some pretty significant draft capital, including four picks in the top 100. My overall key takeaways for the Lions, number one, being able to keep Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn. I think that was absolutely huge. Number two, goner Jonah Jackson and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Number three, in, come Carlton Davis, Kevin Zeitler, DJ Reader, and Amik Robertson. And number four, they do still have four picks in the top 100. So a pretty impressive offseason for the Lions. They were already, you know, kings of the NFC North, won the division, were, you know, a game away from going to the Super Bowl, and had every right to have that opportunity. But instead, they lose to San Francisco. But I, I think they've made some additions. You never quite know for a team like the Lions if they're going to be able to make that step from, hey, we're a good to really good team, but can we be great? Can we be a Super Bowl winner? I still think they have a step to take and their draft is going to be huge for them. Remember, they had a great draft a season ago. Those players are going to continue to get better. Overall, what I think would potentially be a step in the uh, a step back for the Lions after, you know, sort of their upward trajectory, I think they actually continue to take a step forward and they're going to continue to be dangerous in Detroit this season. I overall like this offseason for them so far from a NFL standpoint, from a Packers standpoint, wish maybe they did a little bit worse, but a lot of this still is going to be dependent upon what they are able to do with that draft capital. And hopefully from a Packers standpoint, they don't have as good of a draft as they had a season ago. All right, let's jump over to the Minnesota Vikings who had sort of a bizarro season last year. They started off really well. Then Green Bay had the game where they basically injured Kirk Cousins, had the Achilles injury and then their their season just bottomed out from there. They had Jaron Hall starting games, Josh Dobbs starting games, Nick Mullins starting games, and it just, they could never find any consistency and basically completely tanked their season for the rest of the year. From a coaching standpoint, no real major additions or subtractions other than they do get Josh McCown as a quarterback's coach. If you remember, there were some thoughts that Josh McCown was going to potentially be the head coach in Houston before D'Amico Ryan's got it. He's been sort of this interesting offensive mind that's been bouncing around a little bit. There's a lot of people that think he's super bright and can bring a lot to the table. If Minnesota does get a young quarterback, 
this could be a really key piece for them, but that's really from a coaching standpoint, their only real big time addition or subtraction. And again, that is the addition of Josh McCown. They do have some pretty significant losses this off season, starting with Kirk Cousins. That is a massive loss. Now it's a massive loss from when they had Kirk Cousins last year. It's not a massive loss from when they didn't have Kirk Cousins last year, but we saw the Minnesota Vikings without Kirk Cousins and it was not pretty. And Minnesota did everything they could to try to retain his services. Atlanta gave him more money and he went to Atlanta, got a lot of Coles cash to be their quarterback. And we'll see how he recovers from the Achilles. We'll see what he can do in Atlanta. But that, of course, leaves a huge void at that quarterback spot in Minnesota. They lose Marcus Davenport to the Lions, as we mentioned in the Lions segment. They also lose Daniil Hunter, their other edge rusher, to the Houston Texans. Their other defensive end, DJ Wanham, goes to the Carolina Panthers. So they lose three big-time pass rushers in Davenport, Hunter, and Wanham. At linebacker, they lose both Jordan Hicks and Troy Dye. On the offensive line, they lose sort of a trio of rotational guys in Hakeem Adenji, Austin Schlotman, and Oli Udo. Josh Dobbs leaves for the 49ers. Uh, KJ Osborne goes to the Patriots. Kyrus Tonga goes to the Cardinals. Alexander Madison, their running back, goes to the Raiders. And they released our good friend, Dean Lowry, former Green Bay Packer. Dalton Reisner is their top unsigned free agent. He remains an unrestricted free agent at this point, at least as of recording this. Greg Joseph, their kicker, is still a free agent. Anthony Barr, Sheldon Day, Nick Vigil, and Cam Akers all are also remaining free agents. They did resign some of their own players. Jonathan Bullard, the defensive lineman, Johnny Munt, the tight end, Brandon Powell, the wide receiver, David Questenberry, the offensive lineman, and Blake Brendel, the offensive lineman. And then with losing Kirk Cousins and with all of those defensive departures, meaning, you know, Daniel Hunter and uh, Marcus Davenport and those sort of players, they did have some money to go out and spend. And this is an interesting offseason for Minnesota because they are a little bit in no man's land, depending on what they do at quarterback. If they don't have a quarterback, it may not matter how good the rest of their roster is if they're just stuck in quarterback purgatory. More on that in a moment. But they did decide, then they could have maybe gone cheap, but they didn't. They went out and they spent and they went and they got some veteran players, as you know, because one of them is a former Green Bay Packer. But let's start at the defensive end position. We could start quarterback, but we're going to start defensive end here. They go out and they get two big time pass rushers. Now, you may look at it and say, hey, they lost to Neil Hunter and Marcus Davenport and DJ Wanham. This is going to be a downgrade. I actually, again, from an NFL standpoint, I actually went and watched a lot of both of these players. Don't ask me why, but I did. Uh, Jonathan Grenard and Andrew Van Ginkle, former Badger, Andrew Van Ginkle, uh, they went out and signed both of those players. First of all, Andrew Van Ginkle is going to be such a freak fit in that defense that they run. Uh, he can stand up as a off-ball linebacker. They can use him as an edge rusher. He was great for Miami a season ago. He really got better. Now, he's a little bit on the older side. I think he's 28, 29 at this point, but they signed him to a two-year deal. It was very favorable. I thought that was a really great signing by them, as much as I hate to say it. Jonathan Grenard, same thing. I actually think they got better. Even with losing Daniil Hunter, I think Grenard and Van Ginkle are going to bring a lot to that defense. I think they're going to fit in perfectly. And that's not a great thing if you're a Packer fan, but those are two really big signings and really big players that they went and got in free agency. Then with the linebacker losses they have, they go and they give a pretty decent sized contract to Blake Cashman. Somebody I had mentioned as a potential option for Green Bay as an off-ball linebacker, Minnesota gave him a little bit more money than I probably would have been comfortable Green Bay giving Cashman, but he's a good player coming off the best season of his career. Also, unfortunately, somebody that's going to fit very well within that Vikings defense. So they go and get three big time defensive players in Grenard, Van Ginkle, and Cashman, all who, again, as I say, fit perfect. And that sucks for Green Bay, but they they really do. Uh, Sam Darnold then is the big one, right? You lose Kirk Cousins. They have to have at least some sort of quarterback who can carry the reins until the next guy comes in. Again, more on that in just a moment. Uh, but Sam Darnold is the guy, one-year, $10 million deal coming from San Francisco. I don't have a lot of fear of Sam Darnold if I'm Green Bay. I don't think Kyle Shanahan in one season just fixed Sam Darnold. There's probably some upside there. And, you know, what they get out of him will be interesting, I, I guess. But if you're Green Bay, going from Kirk Cousins to Sam Darnold is just a downgrade. And you're not, like I said, you're not super afraid in Minnesota, if, if they can't find a, a rookie in the draft or somebody to step up sooner rather than later, 
Minnesota, despite having a pretty good roster, I think pretty quickly could go to the bottom of this division sooner rather than later. I think the Bears could jump them. The Packers jumped them last year with the Cousins injury. This is a big deal. You're going from a very stable quarterback, and now whatever we think of Kirk Cousins and whatever the ceiling with Cousins was, you had a very good, very stable quarterback in Cousins, and now you don't. You have a small lottery ticket, meaning like maybe it could pay off a little bit, but there's probably limited upside. This is probably like, uh, not exactly like the Powerball, but this is probably like a scratch off ticket more, right? We're like, hey, if you win like, you know, $10,000, you're still really excited. You weren't expecting it, but you didn't exactly like change your life over it. Uh, unlike like a, you know, two, you know, $2 billion Powerball ticket or something, but it's still, it's something he still was a former top five pick has some upside. Maybe he can put it together. We've seen quarterbacks put it together late in their career in the past, you know, go to the right spot and do that. I do think this Kevin O'Connell offense is ripe for a quarterback like a Sam Darnold to come in and, and have some success, whether that happens or not. Again, if you're a Packer fan, I wouldn't be too worried about it, but this is going to be a big piece probably of the Vikings this year, dependent upon what they do with those draft picks. Of course, they go out and get Aaron Jones as well, which is going to, at least for this year, be a pretty significant upgrade from what they had in Alexander Madison, who again is gone. They go out and get John Parker Romo. Again, for those of you who know who John Parker Romo is, tip of the cap to you. He was the all XFL kicker from the XFL from a season ago. So they're in search of a kicker. John Parker Romo, maybe he's the guy, maybe he's not. We'll have to wait and see. They go get Jerry Tillery from the Raiders, Trent Sherfield, the wide receiver from the Bills, Dan Feeney, offensive lineman from the Bears, Jonah Williams, not the offensive lineman Jonah Williams, defensive lineman Jonah Williams from the Rams, Shaq Griffin, who used to be a really good corner, but has hit some injury issues and just hasn't really done anything lately. They kind of take a little bit of a flyer on him, uh, corner from the Panthers, K- uh, Camus Grugier Hill, linebacker from the Panthers, and then Jihad Ward, a defensive lineman from the New York Giants. Here's the big thing. They have a lot of draft capital. Uh, They have a lot of picks, but two premium ones, and then it falls off a little bit. They have the 11th and the 23rd picks in the draft. They just made a trade to get up to pick 23. The every indication is that they're going to package those two, maybe to get up in the top three for a Drake may more likely to get to four or five to get JJ McCarthy. I, at this point, I would expect JJ McCarthy becomes a member of the Minnesota Vikings. I don't think they have the draft capital to get into the top three and get Drake May. I think that's probably a good thing. I've watched a lot of those quarterbacks already because two of them are going to probably end up in the division. We'll go over all of that on another day, but this is going to be a major, major offseason for Minnesota, either because one, they were able to get up and get one of those rookie quarterbacks, and that will change the trajectory of them moving forward, or B, they were not able to And that changes things quite a bit because now you've got Sam Darnold and Jaron Hall, who looked awful a season ago, is really your only young up and coming quarterback that you're trying to develop in any way. Maybe they pick later. Maybe they end up having to select, you know, a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix or somebody, you know, Spencer Rattler later in the draft. But if they can't do that, then they're kind of in no man's land. Or if they get a guy and he's just not good, they're in no man's land. So what they do with that draft capital is going to alter that franchise in a pretty significant way. But they have picks 11, 23, 108, 129, 157, 167, 177, 230, and 232. What that amounts to is two first round picks, two fourth round picks, two fifth round picks, a sixth round pick, and two seventh round picks. So Only two picks in the first three days, but they are picks 11 and 23. Again, the expectation is that they move that up, probably end up maybe even giving some capital from next year, which they already did to move up into the first round. They could end up with a quarterback and then a lot of day three selections at their disposal and significantly less draft capital next year to go up and get that quarterback. That's an interesting situation for Minnesota. The key takeaways here. The quarterback position, number one, Kirk Cousins is gone. Sam Darnold is in, and they're going to do everything they can to move up and get a quarterback in this draft. Number two, the complete changeover at the edge position out are Davenport, Hunter, and Wanham in are Grenard and Van Ginkle. Like I said, I do think that actually might be a little bit of an upgrade running back out is Alexander Madison, of course, in vomit, gross, disgusting is Aaron Jones, new running back for the Minnesota Vikings. And then that linebacker position out Jordan Hicks and Troy Dye in Blake Cashman. Better or worse for Minnesota? Um, better than when they didn't have Kirk Cousins at the end of the like, second half of last year? Worse than when they did have Kirk Cousins. 
that quarterback position is going to be tough to overcome. Like I said, if they don't solve that in a satisfactory way, this Minnesota team has a direct path to the bottom of the division moving forward. As much as Minnesota fans are going to drag me for that, it, it's a very important position and they don't have a long-term solution as of now. That can change. And if they go up and get a quarterback and he's really, really good, then that can change in a moment's notice. But as of right now, that is a huge, huge question mark for Minnesota. All right, let's end up with the Chicago Bears coaching staff changes. The big thing here is that they stick with the head coach. And I think that's definitely a noteworthy storyline as well. Eberflus is back. And they could have gone in a totally different direction, nuked the coaching staff, maybe either kept or nuked the GM in the, the front office and just started fresh with new front office, new coach, new quarterback. They decided to stick with the front office, stick with the head coach. They're going to get the new quarterback with the first overall pick, but they keep um, Matt Eberflus. They move on from their offensive coordinator. And then they, of course, they had that whole defensive coordinator situation, but their new offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron, who was the offensive coordinator with Seattle, new defensive coordinator, Eric Washington, who was the Buffalo Bills defensive line coach. Uh, of course, though, Matt Eberflus will likely continue to call plays on defense and Eric Washington will be sort of the you know rest of the duties as defensive coordinator. The major losses for the Bears, not a ton here. Of course, Justin Fields, but he gets traded for a six round pick that you knew they were going to go get a quarterback anyway. So not actually a major loss there. Darnell Mooney, the wide receiver, goes to the Atlanta Falcons, gets a pretty decent sized deal in Atlanta. It's a decent sized loss. They cut Eddie Jackson. They cut Cody Whitehair, their longtime offensive lineman, who wasn't playing for them anyway. And Eddie Jackson was playing really bad football for them. So those aren't actually huge losses. Justin Jones, famous for talking smack to the Green Bay Packers before they lost both games. Uh, he goes to the Arizona Cardinals. Sad to see him go. Uh, Dante Foreman, running back, goes to the Cleveland Browns. Dan Feeney, as we mentioned earlier, goes to the Vikings. And Nate Peterman, the journeyman quarterback, goes to the Saints. Unique Ngakwe, Lucas Patrick, Robert Tunyon, a couple former Packers there. There's going to be more of those. Rasheem Green, Mercedes Lewis, Equinemius St. Brown, Trent Taylor, and Dylan Cole all remain unsigned, as do Eddie Jackson and Cody Whitehair, who they released. They did re-sign three players, Jalen Johnson being the biggest of those. There was some question for a while whether or not Chicago and Jalen Johnson were going to be able to come to an agreement and reach a deal. They did. It's one of the best corners in football. Really good deal for Chicago to get him back. Jalen Johnson gets a good deal out of it as well. Works out great for both sides. Doesn't work out as great for Green Bay or Minnesota or Detroit, who has to continue to face Jalen Johnson in the division, but it is what it is. He stays in the division. Really, really good player. Patrick scales their long snappers back, as is Dante Pettis, the journeyman wide receiver. Chicago did not end there, though. They decided to go out and spend, both via free agency and some trades. Traded a fourth-round pick, traded a fifth-round pick, and like I said, did some shopping. That fourth-round pick... They trade for Keenan Allen, the wide receiver from the Chargers. They go out and sign Kevin Byard, who is the safety from the Eagles, who was released this offseason. DeAndre Swift, running back from the Eagles, big free agent acquisition. In fact, I think the first uh, free agent that was announced uh, after the legal tampering period started. Gerald Everett, the tight end from the Chargers, comes along as well. Ryan Bates, they send a fifth round pick to Buffalo for his services. He's an offensive lineman. Jacob Martin, edge rusher from the Colts. Coleman Shelton, likely a potential starter on the interior of the offensive line, who was a center for the Rams, Jonathan Owens from the Packers, Brett Rippon, the quarterback who the Packers beat as a member of the Rams last year. And then the Rams basically cut him after that game. Uh, he goes to Chicago, Matt Pryor, offensive lineman from the 49ers. Amin Agban big, big, that's probably wrong. Linebacker from the Chargers, uh, Byron Coward, defensive tackle from the Dolphins and Jack Curran, an offensive tackle from the Seattle Seahawks. I think the interesting thing here is they did not, you know, you, you know how Green Bay is sort of on that timeline right now. Everyone's like sort of 26, 27 and under. They got a ton of young players and they're all developing on the same timeline. Chicago is going to go get a new quarterback, but they go and get Keenan Allen, older wide receiver, Gerald Everett, older tight end, Kevin Byard, very old 30 plus safety, DeAndre Swift, not old, but he's been in the league for a while. Like they're sort of going and, you know, Jonathan Owens is another one. Matt Pryor is another one. They went the veteran route, the older veteran route, almost like the, the, the mercenary route. Like they're ready to win right now. What that tells me is that that front office and that coaching staff needs to win right now. They know they're going to get a new quarterback, but they have to show the, you know, everyone in the powers that be in Chicago that they can go out and win. And that's a great thing. If you're a Packer fan, 
it would be a lot worse if they started to build this thing with Caleb Williams and start everything on a new timeline. They didn't go that way. Now, that's going to make things harder right now when you face the Chicago Bears, having to face Keenan Allen and DJ Moore at wide receiver with Gerald Everett and Cole Komet at tight end and DeAndre Swift at running back. Cole, you know, Obviously, Caleb Williams at quarterback. Like That's going to make things a lot tougher right now. But they could have gone younger. They could have gone you know, probably with some maybe richer yet younger, you know, players, they could have gone out instead of, you know, Kevin Byer and they could have got, you know, Xavier McKinney. They could have easily outspent Green Bay for a 24 year old safety. It's what I would have done if I were Chicago. I would have went the younger, better, cheaper, or not younger, better, cheaper, but younger, better, more expensive route rather than going with aged veterans. So I kind of like this for Green Bay, the direction that they went, but I also understand it where Chicago has to win now or, you know, uh, the, the, the GM and the head coach aren't going to be along and they're not going to be there to see the fruits of their labor because the next GM and next head coach will be there to be able to see all of their youth come to fruition. But for green Bay, you don't necessarily mind that they're sort of caught between two timelines right now. And that's not a, not a bad thing. If you're a Packer fan, of course, from a draft standpoint, they have the number one overall pick the ninth overall pick, the 75th overall pick and the 122nd, uh, overall pick. That's it. A one, a one, a three, and a four. Not a lot of picks, but really quality picks. Again, two top 10 picks, including the first overall. Thanks a lot, Carolina Panthers, for that, you idiots. Uh, 75th overall is the third, and then 122nd overall is their fourth. The key takeaways for Chicago, Caleb Williams is going to be the new quarterback of the Chicago Bears. That is going to be a earth-shattering move one way or the other. Either he is going to be as expected, and that will put a huge ripple in the state of the NFC North, or they get it wrong again, he busts or just isn't what they expect, and it's Mitch Trubisky fast all over again, and this is going to have to be another reset by the Chicago Bears. A huge, huge shift one way or the other, dependent upon if Caleb Williams is the next Mahomes, the next, I don't know, some middle-of-the-line Baker Mayfield-ish quarterback, or just a complete Mitch Trubisky bust. How that works out, well, like I said, we'll, we'll shift things tremendously in the NFC North. Of course, Eberflus stays. I think that's the number two takeaway. Number three, not only do they have the number one overall pick, but they have the number nine overall pick. They're going to have the opportunity to upgrade that roster with that pick. My guess is they probably move down because they don't have a ton of draft capital um, with only having that, what, third and fourth after it. So my guess is they move down, maybe try to pick up an extra second round pick or an extra third and a fifth and my guess is they try to accumulate, you know, seven, eight draft picks overall by by moving some of those picks down. But either way, they're going to be able to use that nine pick to get more capital or get a really good top 10 player. They re-sign Jalen Johnson. They get some key veteran additions that are going to help them win now, even if maybe not three, four years from now. And Keenan Allen, Kevin Byard, DeAndre Swift, and Gerald Everett. And then really Darnell Mooney, their only big loss. So are the Bears better or worse? They're way better in my opinion. And I think they're way better because at worst, at worst, I expect Caleb Williams to be able to do what, what Justin Fields did. And in the meantime, they get some pretty significant additions. They restart the clock at the quarterback position, having a really cheap option, you know, that's on the first year of a rookie deal, even if it is the first overall pick and guys, I hate to say it, but I think Caleb Williams is it. I think he's going to be phenomenal. I know some people will disagree with that. Like I said, I'll go over that in a, a, a probably another episode at some point, but um, they're going to get better because of this and probably in a very significant way if Caleb Williams is as advertised. And like I said, I do think he's going to be, but that's the fun of this is we're going to have to wait and see. And these big quarterback acquisitions for Chicago and ultimately what probably becomes in Minnesota as well is going to have longstanding effects on this division. Detroit stays status quo, but gets some veterans that can help them win now. Chicago caught between two worlds with Caleb Williams and the number nine pick, but also going out and getting some 30 year, you know, 30 year old veteran, you know, players to help them win now to keep their GM and coach in their, in their jobs, basically. And you got Minnesota who is aggressively adding players to the roster, but don't have the quarterback as of yet, but are aggressively trying to go out and get that young quarterback, but also sort of stuck between two timelines then of you've got this really young quarterback, but you've got a roster that's outside of the quarterback kind of ready to win now. Guess what? I kind of like Green Bay's position overall. They're on the same timeline. They've got great young players. And at the end of the day, as much as we do want to keep an eye on the Lions, the Vikings, and the Bears, the Packers need to be the Packers. They need to be the best, best versions of themselves because they they need to go out and make the playoffs, whether through the division or through getting a wild card. 
And they need to be the best team in the NFL if we, this is who we want them to be, right? They, we want them to go out and be Super Bowl champs. So I, I do think it's always important to keep an eye on the NFC North, especially in an offseason like this, where you do have potentially two massive quarterback changes that will alter this division. But Green Bay's in a good spot. They've got Jordan freaking love. They've got a lot of young playmakers, and they just need to take care of their business. And if so, I like their odds better than anyone else in the division at this point and where they currently stand. Now, I'm not saying... That means they're going to jump Detroit this year. We're, we're going to have to see how these rosters play out and who stays healthy and those sort of things. But let's just say Green Bay's in a good position. But I really would argue right now, Minnesota has gotten better than what they were at the end of last year. The Kirk Cousins things keeps it in flux a little bit. I mean, in like, like when they had Cousins, they were good. When they didn't, they were really bad. So sort of in between that. Uh, but I do think really Detroit and Chicago have gotten better and Minnesota outside of the quarterback spot has gotten better as well. Just what can they do at that QB spot and can it be good enough to replace and be competitive in 2024? All right, that's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you guys right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. Shout out to our hall of fame and all pro members, most hated Minnesota and PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Brad dad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. See you guys soon, but until next time, and as always, go Paco.